Superintendent, I make a motion to approve the um, minutes 2.1 to 2.2. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Narcisse? Yes. Mrs. Rumet? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Zyre? Yes. Mrs. Aquino? Yes. Mrs. Fenton? Yes. Dr. Gales? Yes. Dr. Giordano? Yes. Mr. Strelacci? Yes, yeah, so I'm too warm to say I'm too cool. Okay. Communications and petitions. Does any board member have any communication or petition? I suit ten. Dr. Fanger, do you have any suit ten? Commission? Communication? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, reports and discussion. We do not have some raise on here tonight. Superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I do have a report. Um, we're actually going to be presenting on state data tonight. Okay. So you can put up the presentation, please. Um, so first of all, we are going to be reviewing a, a great deal of data that ranges from our NJSLA testing in relation to ELA, math, science, also the new NJGPA test, our access for ELLs, and our DLM. And um, tonight I have with me my fabulous instructional team. We have Mr. Matt Robinson, who's going to be presenting along with me. We have Ms. Leah Mogosiak, who is our um, ELA um, supervisor at grades 6 to 12. Mr. Keith Lucid, who is our supervisor for mathematics 6 to 12, as well as Chris Jensen, who is our lead teacher for um, science. So I'm going to ask Mr. Robinson if you want to come up to the mic, and we're going to we're going to tag team this together. Um, you know, certainly one of the reasons that I wanted the entire team to be here is certainly our approach to our work together. It's going to be collaborative in nature to ensure that we're meeting the needs of all our students. Um, you know, one of the things we always like to start off with is how this is aligned to our goals. And certainly when you look at the, you know, I know it's typically small, but our most critical goal and first goal is here is providing the most um, um, innovative and safe learning environment possible for the entire um, district community. And certainly we want to make sure that our test um, progress for our students is reflecting of the best abilities that they can make for as students. But certainly before we dive into the data, one of the things I do want to make very, very clear that while we do believe that these set types of assessments are very critical, but we're not going to overly rely on one assessment to divide, define the student. Instead, we're going to continue to embrace a data-informed approach in which we support students by looking at a variety of measures, including both hard and soft data points. Um, in the end, we believe our students are more than test scores and we'll continue to support them in a manner that meets each student's unique needs. So um, one of the things that we're going to start off with is we're going to be looking at our NJSLA um, assessments. Now, just a little background here. Um, the NJSLA was introduced in the spring of 2019. For previously, it was referred to as PARC for ELA and math, and NJASC for science. As you know, for the spring of 2020 and the spring of 21, no testing was done due to COVID. And this past um, spring is when the NJSLA test was reintroduced and um, was for um, ELA, um, math, and science. I'm actually going to pause right now because our um, student representative just walked in, and I certainly don't want to. This may be a lengthy presentation, and I don't want to have to wait, so I'm, I'm going to 
turn it over and it's going to pause myself because I, I, I don't want to keep you. Is that is that okay? The board is that fine? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I just, you know. Hi. <laughs> 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 Hi, good evening, everyone. December has taken off quickly at the high school. In a short yet productive month, many items have been accomplished. Foremost, immediate congratulations are owed to the music department. As the following students were accepted into the prestigious 2023 All Eastern Instrumental Ensembles, senior Alvaro Caravaca achieved the All Eastern Jazz Ensemble, senior Ryan Parachuk in the All Eastern Orchestra, and junior Alex Maswet in the All Eastern Band. These big nominations are especially notable as it's the first time that our department has had more than one student accepted in one year, and the first time for any of our students to be accepted into the All Eastern Orchestra or Jazz Ensemble. In addition, congratulations to the following students that have been accepted into the North Jersey Area Band. Barbara Ashley, Riley Friesway, Alex Masuet, Ryan Parachuk, and Sylvana Strumbo. Charlie Stokely also auditioned and was the first runner up in the alto saxophone category. Congratulations to all of the students on their hard work and success. Congratulations are also owed to the Mount Olive debate team for their outstanding performances last Friday night. They took home a prominent win at the Kittatinny High School in the Northwest New Jersey Debate League Tournament in a 6-2 victory. The Mount Olive debate team currently leads the league in scores for the season. So let's keep that up in momentum going to championships in February. This month, some honor societies at the high school have also held induction ceremonies. Both the National Math Honor Society and Bro Capital Social Studies Honor Society have welcomed their newest members. Congratulations to all inductees. December 3rd also held the annual Snow Land Dance. As in past years, the student council had a set up the Friday night before. The calf was turned into a winter wonderland, Christmas trees and all. As students entered, the hallway leading up was decked out with ice cold lights to create a mystical ambiance. Students packed in for a fun-filled night, making it a tremendous success for everyone. For some events to look forward to, the Air Force Junior ROTC is hosting a blood drive tomorrow in the CAF from 2.30 to 6.30 p.m. Wednesday will additionally be the Winter Choral and Band Concert. The Winter Orchestra Concert will also be on Tuesday, December 20th. Dawson's representatives will also be meeting with both the senior and the sophomore class in the upcoming week. On Monday, December 19th, the reps will meet with the sophomores to provide details on class ranks, while on Tuesday, December 20th, representatives will inform seniors about caps and gowns for graduation. Lastly, winter sports have begun. Be sure to follow all the happenings and updates on the Mount Olive Athletic Twitter page. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. We're going to transition back to the riveting talk about state assessments. <laughs> As we left off, the NJSLA testing returned this past spring in 2022. Um, the reason I wanted to um, point out this slide is because for some of our students, this is the first time they've tested in a number of years. For example, if you look at our fifth grade students, they've never really had an NJSLA test like this of this magnitude ever. And certainly our sixth graders, the last time they had that was th in third grade. And certainly that's true for other grade levels as well. Um, so certainly um, recognizing that our performance did, did not match our prior to um, pre-COVID, certainly we do have steps in place in order to reachieve um, the growth that we had in previous school years. Um, as far as who's tested and with respect to elementary and um, middle school students, all students grades three to eight are tested in ELA and math. Math is a little different when you get into high school when they start taking a high school based math test. That's the math test that they take unless they're in sixth grade and they take some kind of high school math, which is not done here in Mount Olive. But traditionally, when you get into middle school, it is your grade level math class or your um, high school based math class. And understand that in um, eighth and fifth grade, you also have the science assessments. Understand that um, students um, with disabilities are in some cases of exempt from testing. In some cases, they take what is called the DLM. Am I seeing the, the screen? Is that just, it's just not me? It's flickering? Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure it's not in my head right now. Like, <laughs> um, okay. Now, as far as the high school students are concerned, um, only ninth grade students have to take the ELA test. 
math. Um, you know, ninth grade students are the ones who take in the test and they took algebra one in middle school. They take the next preceding test. However, the little caveat is if they take a two-year algebra one class, they do not take the NJSL NJSLA for algebra one until they complete the actual sequence for math. And then science, our 11th graders take the NJSLA science. So the way that this presentation is broken down is when we're talking about how students pass, you'll notice that there are five different levels of performance. A levels four and five is what cons is considered for students to pass um, um, versus levels one, two, and three. So that is where they're um, exceeding and meeting um, expectations in which we're going to be reviewing that data. Um, the first section of review is going to be looking at NJSLA. So Mr. Matt Robinson, as well as Ms. Leo Borgosiak, is going to be covering the data related to the achievement in um, this subject area. All right, well, thank you. Happy to be here tonight. We'll try to make this as quick but as informative as possible. So um, this first chart that shows our um, levels of achievement, we see that in Mount Olive region, 65% proficiency that both four and five combined compared to the state, which had 49% proficiency. So we're able to beat the state on the ELA overall. This is our grade by grade breakdown, and we see that um, our strongest performance was among the grade seven students. Um, and we see that we, um, we, we start off a little soft in grade three, and um, we, we grow from there, have a little bit of a dip after seventh grade, and we you know, continue to grow again. And we're, we're pretty consistently beating the state across the board. So just to so reiterate that the top um, bar graphs are related to our district performance versus the bottom of the state. So you can look at a comparison between each grade level and you'll notice um, regardless of the grade level that we outperform the state averages um, from grades um, three through nine. Thank you. So the key takeaways from this, obviously the majority of students passed the NJSLA. The student higher achievement compared with the state as discussed, strong achievement in grade seven and we had some inconsistent forms between the grade levels, um, the standard grade three and four, and grade seven and eight. So that's something for us to analyze moving forward. We have our five-year look back, um, combined meeting and exceeding. We see that we have dipped coming out of COVID. The last time we assessed these children with the NJSLA was in 2018 19. And you know, we see that we dipped across the board, but grade level performance is relative to how they performed in the past. And certainly, we, we're not here tonight to gloss over as far as, you know, these areas of concern. We recognize, and certainly a part of our presentation, we are going to be looking at our next steps as a district that we have to take. And certainly how we have an amazing administrative team who's going to be leading that work with our thoughtful and you know, well-experienced staff. Thank you. Now we'll get into the demographic performance. So this is a chart of the different racial backgrounds of our students and their performance um, in terms of meeting and exceeding expectations. We go to the next slide. We have a bar graph that's a little bit easier to read and at the top we have our levels of um, meeting and exceeding standard posted there. And one of the things that we are well recognizing is about the disparity of performance. No one's going to sit here and state that this is, you know, something that we're okay with, right? When you look at, you know, a performance of um, subgroups, for example, when you look at our Hispanic student population of 50% um, achieving proficiency, that is something that we as a district are dedicated to, you know, look further into and make sure we put measures in place to ensure all our students are achieving. Um, so when we're looking at this sub take takeaway, you know, certainly there's very, very uh, performance performance against the different subgroups. While we're, there are areas of we should celebrate with our Asian as well as our multi -sub um, subgroups. When we talk about multiple, that means they identify um, different races, not necessarily one. And certainly, however, there's other groups that we do want to look at. But as far as a, um, a trend analysis across the past five years, you'll notice that um, with the exception of our Asian population, each of our um, subgroups there has declined um, compared to 2019. Please, Dr. On the, on the previous slide, I, I believe that there are uh, percentages of the represented population, correct? Yes. So um, in terms of the concept of disproportionality, mm -hmm. have you looked at the, the uh, percentage of the population of each group to their 
Yeah, yes, because I, you know, I think the question here is, you know, when you have a smaller subpopulation, a, a particular student out, you know, that is more valued as far as when you have, you know, 13% of our population in one group versus 70% of something else, you're absolutely right. But certainly at the end of the day, our could still concerns that when you look at Hispanics population in regards, I believe they're about 13%, when you're looking at only 50% of them um, achieving um, proficiency, that is a concern. And, you know, and that's why we are here to say that we have work to do, but the work we're going to do is going to be collaborative in fashion in forms of working with our teachers, working with our students in order to identify how we can further support them. Um, just because at the end of the day, you know, you know, our, you know, we tr talk about, you know, being um, marauder for life and being proud and all these kids on that screen, you know, that slide is representative of our student population. So we're really looking at ways, and certainly Ms. Rogoziak, as well as Mr. Robinson, has taken a look at some steps in order to kind of look at that, which we're going to be looking at right away. So, you know, but we'll, before that, we'll look at gender, too. And, and here you see the breakdown of gender um, and how they perform across the different bands. If we go to the next slide, you'll see, and we have a disparity here as well between the performance of female and male. Um, in EI across the district, a 72% uh, passing rate for females and 59 for males. So this is another thing to take a look at. We need to take a look at representation across the curriculum. We need to take a look at our staff and make sure that they're representing the student population as well. And certainly we wanted to take a look at as far as a, um, in perspective of previous school years. So while, um, you know, certainly our female students tended, tended to outperform our students, that um, divide has only grown. And that's something else that we're looking at as well to ensure that, you know, both our male and female students are going to be um, um, passing successively the assessment. And then a uh, breakdown by programs. So we have um, another different programs represented here. Our free reduced lunch population, our set through 504 population, our ELL students, our special education students, and our general ed students. And again, we see um, you know, a, a wide disparity in, in performance there as well. How far back does that go? So this one is just this particular, this, this, this particular. Right so next, the next slide will show us. going to represent our prior performance. And we see, um, you know, unfortunately, it's representative of, of a trend that's been going on in Mount Olive for a long time, right? So the gender subgroup performed all, outperformed all other subgroups. And our ELL subgroup with a higher percentage of students that were not but also has a higher percentage of students who are not who are approaching standards. So um, again, taking a look at how we can bump those students up. I want to say I do appreciate Dr. Vander sent this to the board members. I do appreciate it. I hope my fellow colleagues understand that this is a systemic problem that I'm sure you can go back to 2010 and the data will still be the same that we have not been addressing. Yeah. yeah. And certainly, you know, as I said, this this presentation is to recognize that we have areas of growth to do, but also celebrate the hard work that has been done. But certainly, this is a collaborative effort that, you know, it's not an island kind of approach that we are engaging in ongoing conversations with our staff. The um, amazing um, instructional team, 6 to 12, as, Matt, as well as Mr. Matt Robinson, have been meeting with PLCs, have meeting, been meeting with grade levels, um, teachers to really get a sense of boots on ground. Right, really, at the end of the day, and as you know, I want to point back to our first slide talking about making data informed decisions. Right, we want to make sure that they may not be performing well here, but how are they performing in our class? How are they um, being comfortable and getting to their own as young adults and being successful as they leave us? Which is another area that we want to look at as to how successful are our students as they leave us in, in, as far as their post graduation plans. So, that's another part of this. But as far as our action steps, you know, Mr. Robinson, if you want to speak telemetry. Sure, of course. So we really try to place an emphasis on tier one instruction. That's what goes on in the classroom, right? Before we refer kids for RPI services for tier two or tier three, what can we do in tier one to hold the performance and to differentiate instruction? So um, we're doing that via responsive reading group and reading. And we're really taking a look at ensuring that guided reading is being called with fidelity in K through three. We're utilizing the book club approach in grades four through five, and we're using strategy groups, which is you know, breaking down the different reading strategies and kind of triaging what students need in the moment for all grades. We're also doing text-based TLCs with all elementary teachers this year. Everyone who grades K through three is going to be shifting the balance, and their instructional supervisors at each of the buildings are 
built in into the conversation about how we could integrate the science of reading into the classroom. Okay, so going back to you know, which we've read and heard a lot about phonics instruction, how are we integrating that into our guided reading groups? Both mm -hmm. well, uh, grades four and five are reading, reading new life into book clubs. Again, to facilitate authentic conversations about text and really um, you know give kids those strategies to work their way through through novel through authentic books. Yes. So to uh, Dr. J. Dale's point, we have been dealing with these kind of data trends for a number of years. And a couple of years ago, when we talked about reading, mm -hmm. one of the, the concerns that I raised was the kind of literature that's in classroom libraries that are in our libraries, and whether or not we have a diverse selection, selection of reading material. And I suggested a few years ago that we look into uh, this company in New York called Leelo Books, which is one of the largest distributors of diverse reading material in the country. And I don't think we have looked into that to date. What's the company called? Leelo Books. They're out of New York. And we ha I don't think we've looked into that. And I, I believe that if you introduce diverse reading material into the curriculum, whether it is a part of Instructional Day or if you're doing, if you're in WIN or, or here, mm -hmm. that if kids are reading material with main characters that look like them, mm -hmm. they may be more interested mm -hmm. in reading material. Right. So we've been talking about this for a long time, and hopefully we will take some action on it. So I did not plant this question, but I'm so glad that you did that, because I know Ms. Morgoziak will be able to speak to that with fidelity, because certainly the work that she's been doing, both at the middle school and high school, is really about also infusing what as you know book club opportunities. Book clubs are in which you know there are high interest books in which are from current topics in which students have the opportunity to choose and engage in conversation with one another because the whole goal is to make lifelong readers. But certainly at the elementary standpoint, when we shifted over to a reading workshop model in which we no longer have you know like the whole class novel, everyone's reading the same novel our um, cl class libraries are much more full of variety of texts. Um, so it is much more diverse compared to X amount of years ago, but certainly I'll certainly explore, continue to expand that. And certainly our um, building libraries have also diversified their offerings. So that is something that we've been continuing to do, but certainly the strategies in which the classroom teachers are employing allow the teacher um, students to be much more accommodating um, to their interest areas and um, topics wise so that they can um, dive deeper into the text. And that's really what those book clubs are about. And also certainly when you talk about about guided reading, it's really about differentiation. And that's the mantra here that we're trying to ensure within the elementary framework is about making sure that we're working at the very levels of our students as opposed to providing, you know, large class instruction. Not saying it doesn't happen, because it has to happen, but certainly under that pretext is about that first is meeting the individual needs, but also providing opportunities as a whole class to learn together. I will say there may be other companies, so oh. <laughs> 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 love it. just the one that pops into my head. So there may be others, so please do research. I like that you asked that question. It was that was great. But I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Leo Rogoziak and she's gonna talk about both middle school and high school. <laughs> So after looking at the data, um, we really spent some time looking at what our students were, be were being asked to do on these different types of assessments and what types of questions they were being asked to respond to. And we decided to um, have a renewed emphasis placed on the rigor and relevance. I say renewed emphasis because this hasn't gone away, but we're really focusing on Quad D. And Quad D is where our students are doing the thinking and our students are doing the doing. Um, and in order to achieve that, we've tasked our wonderful teachers with creating uh, performance assessments that require students to synthesize reason and then ultimately create. And there is voice and choice that we instill in those performance tasks, which I think is so important um, for all of our students to be able to do. We also ask that teachers utilize the release materials, the writing prompts and the reading comprehension questions to correlate with the skills that are being assessed in class. We ask that they use this not necessarily to spend an entire period or a block um, teaching to the test, but to use this as do now so they become familiar with the language that's on this test, how the questions are being asked. Um, and then something that I'm really excited about is this whole idea of the one school, one writing rubric. We just started this. Um, it's a long process. 
but we are re we are uh, reassessing all of our writing rubrics at the middle school, and we really have this this whole idea of this team framework at the middle school, right? If you're on a certain team, then you see you know the same. We have the social studies teacher, the ELA teacher, the science, and so when we ask our students to write, we should be asking our students to write the same way, right? Good writing is good writing, and they shouldn't necessarily have a different language for that good writing depending on what subject they're in. So um, I'm working closely with Mr. Tom Resca, who's a department chair for social studies right now, and we're focusing on sixth grade, one grade at a time, and we're looking at the starting with the standards, looking at what kind of writing is being assessed and what are we asking our students to do at the end of sixth grade, and then we're going to be creating an outline that will be used across the content areas and a writing rubric that will be used across the content areas. So students know when they're asked to write regardless of whether it's in ELA class or in social studies class or even a science class, they know that they will be assessed the same way. And so while it becomes, it's um, incumbent on the ELA teacher to teach the writing skills, they're being assessed the same way in all the subject areas. And then to further support the skill, this goal, I'm sorry, the building level administration will work with department chairs to ensure we have a very well articulation. And I can say that the building level administration has been amazing in supporting this goal already. Um, it's not easy necessarily to get time for vertical articulation. We're all really busy, um, but we have been shifting away at this. So that was the middle school. Next slide. And then at the high school, we're going to we're doing the same thing with our synthesis, reason, and creation with our performance assessments. Um, we've been kind of working together as an entire ELA department, six through twelve, and we're sharing our samples that we're creating with each other and giving each other different ideas. Well, I'm also tasking those teachers with using those release items um, as do nows in order to better prepare our students for assessments. Um, we're really also focusing on RTI at the high school. We have something called the Literacy Lab that we've had for a couple of years now that's manned by um, an ELA teacher in the morning and an ELA teacher in the afternoon. And we bring our kids, we take our kids out of study hall if they need support with some of these skills. So it's not necessarily like they're coming out and they're getting a whole curriculum, but if they are struggling with characterization or they're struggling with analytical writing, the, the uh, RTI teacher or the ELA teacher will focus specifically on that skill. Um, we're focusing on creating a process for which the classroom teacher can continue to communicate to the literacy lab the specific skills in need of remediation. So it's not necessarily a study hall. We're not working on the actual work that they're doing in the ELA classroom, but if the ELA teacher sees you know, there's really an issue with writing a thesis statement, well then that's something that the RTI teacher, the ELA teacher will work on. And so we're kind of streamlining that process as well. So um, I certainly just want to, um, you know, give homage to um, this, um, to Leah right now, just because the work she's doing is not only related to ELA, but certainly her collaboration with other departments um, from the 6 to 12 perspective. And that's how we really want to make sure that our students are getting that same message, whether it be um, from the, um, Socialized teacher or ELA teacher, so I just wanted to commend her for her hard work, certainly to make sure that work's done across the spectrum. And certainly, um, I would also be remiss if I did not recognize the instructional supervisors at the elementary school. Um, they've been instrumental in, um, in, in, in implementing those PLCs in which they're grounded in those conversations. So certainly where they are not here tonight, they've been um, very key in order to ensure that that work is being done on a regular ongoing basis because they are really the in-house people. But once again, thank you, Leah. Thank you. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of replicate this, but we're looking at mathematics right now. So I want to invite Mr. Keith Lucid, who is our, also our supervisor for uh, Mathematics 6 to 12, to join Mr. Matt Robinson to kind of look at this um, mathematics performance of our students from um, grades um, um, 3 to high school. Yeah, sure. So, you know, similarly, you know, we have a PLA, our district analysis here, 47% um, of our students met or exceeded expectations on the NJSLA math and versus 37% of those students from the, room, the rest of the state. This is our grade by grade breakdown as compared to the state. Take a moment to look at that. So once again, the stop the top is our district, the lower is our, is our state, and you can make a um, alignment as to looking out for our progression versus those of the state. And you'll notice that in every grade level, our students out um, achieve with the exception of um, grade eight math. Uh, math. Keith, do you want to speak to that as to why that may be the case there? Sure. And we have the Algebra One program that we start in eighth grade. The majority of our eighth grade students take Algebra One. So the Math Eight population 
are those that are not ready for Algebra 1 yet. So it's not the full, that, that score is not representing this full eighth grade class. They're not all taking that test. Some of them, most of them are taking the Algebra 1 test. So it's a, it's a significant, or I should say, it's a smaller portion of the population that are, that are taking the Math 8. The geometry went down a little bit, as we see there. The state had 42, we had 40. We spent a lot of time focusing on the Algebra 1, and now we need to make sure we don't neglect geometry. That's something that we've started this year, going back to making sure that that's part of our Tier 2 process, those that are in the geometry group, not just in the Algebra 1 group. As we, the state looks like it's moving more towards the NJ GPA test, that's focusing on the Algebra 1 and geometry so we want to make sure we don't, don't neglect geometry. That's a new effort we're starting this year. So the, the key takeaways that we see here, do uh, you want me to speak to this one? Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, just the same thing that I was just speaking about, with the exception of uh, eighth grade and geometry, math eight and geometry, uh, we have outperformed and, and we're, we're growing. So there are some good things that we see here. Uh, the Algebra 1, the Algebra 2 did very well. Uh, just um, say great job, but we want to make sure we see what areas they do need to continue growth in. So there are certainly some things we can improve with it, but happy to see that, that there has been improvement with the efforts we've been putting in over the last few years. Next slide. Yeah, I'll let you go. Sure, absolutely. Okay, so again, we see our, our subgroup analysis for race here. Easier seeing the, the bar chart with the numbers above. The moment we digest that, and we'll get into the next portion. So our takeaways from this was were, you know, our students who identify as Asian and multiple only saw a slight dip in achievement versus their prior performance prior to pre-COVID. Um, our students who identify as black, Hispanic, and white all experienced a double digit drop in performance as compared to 2018-19. And this is something that we um, talked about with ELA, and certainly this is something that we're looking at to ensure that regardless of the student's identified background, it is something that we're working on to ensure that they are um, meeting the proficiency required for that particular course. Absolutely. Gender, here you see the gender breakdown, much closer for math, 46 to 49 percent um, passed overall. And we said both males and females perform similarly and both perform within a few percentage points of one another in each of the performance bands. The performance is relative to years past, as you can see as well. Going into program, we have our free reduced lunch, 504, ELL, special education, and general ed. All overall achievement in town performance within subgroups is proportionate to previous years. And <laughs> We've talked at this point at length about the fact that we need to address this to close these achievement gaps. Our next step, so in the elementary level, we're working to address gaps in standards knowledge from the COVID shutdown. We know math builds upon itself, right? So when we, we have to try to take a look at what standards were missed and, and teach those before we can get into more advanced concepts in each of the grade levels. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, our pacing guide was revamped for certain grade levels, two, three, and four to maximize the delivery of standards that are going to yield optimal growth. And Deanne Cornon, our math coach, has been wonderful about taking a, a close look at our curriculum and the math curriculum now is probably closer to a living, breathing curriculum that you could possibly have. Um, our guided math groups and work are differentiated in levels meet the needs of all students. Our interventionists are working with RTI students on their level of need, focusing on the fundamentals, including using success maker, Ames Web, intervention lessons, embedded in vision, Free teaching spiral materials, uh, all used to bridge any gaps that exist. And she continues to provide on demand PD and instructional feedback to novice and experienced teachers alike. So, for the, the middle and high school, a lot of this we'll see parallels what is happening in ELA as, as you know, we work very close together as a team. So, performance pass has been our focus for what we want to start making sure the students are, are being able to uh, have that higher level thinking, the rigor and relevance. Um, we have mentioned the quad D. We want to make sure that students don't just deal with the skill, but can see it in application, can see how this uh, these skills are, are applied. Not only that, but starting the unit off 
with an idea or a real life application that then drives the purpose for the skill. We see a lot of questions. NJ GPA has the same concept of these questions that are transfer. We don't want to just see them do the skill. We want to see them apply it to a situation. So the performance task is something we're building into our units, part of the essential question, so that the unit itself is going to be driven behind a project or a problem or something that they can apply the skills to. Likewise, with the, the classroom assessments, we're going to make sure that we are looking at our formative summons assessments, making sure they match in language and content to what they can expect to see on the NJSLA, the Lincoln test, not necessarily teaching to the test, but once again, these tests have great questions. These questions are very thought provoking. And so we want to make sure that the students are seeing the same kinds of questions <coughs> in our own assessments in class. The uh, lessons unit plans will continue to use tier one differentiation strategies. In part with this, we have our station rotation model that we introduced a few years back. We're continuing to develop lessons and units around uh, ideas like station rotation, which give the teacher the opportunity to work in, in small groups within the classroom. And then Rubicon Atlas is something we're continuing to look at for scope and sequence. As we look at our results from Lincoln, we look at these results from NJSLA, we want to make sure that we can see in our curriculum where are we covering it, how much of it is being covered, how are we covering it. So Rubicon Atlas has really been a good tool to kind of see that overall as a big picture. And we're continuing to use Alex Math, which is our online program that helps the students practice taking tests online, seeing how to solve problems, uh, work with math in an online platform. Specifically with algebra and geometry, I won't read through all of this, but our math achievement lab is what we've uh, done as our tier two intervention strategy. What we've done is identified students from the form A test on Lincoln, which was given in September, and we've pulled a roster of students for algebra one and geometry uh, together that we feel are at risk that we want to be able to remediate and find what other skills are lacking. So teachers pull them from their study halls, pull them from uh, electives, things that are not going to be pulled on a regular basis. Actually, it's just study halls, I should say, that we're pulling them from so that we're not interfering with their actual academic classes, but we're able to work with them in a small group setting and focus on just those specific topics they need remediation in. Likewise, with uh, the RTI committee, we're going to continue meeting with them to see what other students that we need to identify through other forms, teacher recommendation, uh, behavior, so that we can uh, make sure that all students are, are being reached. Last thing I just have there is, is Math Workshop. It's a class we run that's specific to working with kids in a more intense fashion. Unlike the Math Achievement Lab, where we're pulling kids out, you know, maybe once a week, the, the actual workshop class would have them for a whole semester. So now we're looking at kids that are even more at risk, those that, that really need the help that's more intense. They'll actually have it built into their schedule, part of the rotation, that they'll be pulled out and work with for these remedial skills. So I just want to um, certainly point out the hard work that also Keith has done. And certainly if you look at especially our middle school in which we have so many very um, classes students are um, taking, whether it be grade level math classes, whether it be advancing to algebra one and geometry, um, but certainly um, Ms. Lucid had developed various lines of achievement and success for our students. And I think that's so really important because every child progresses at a different stage and he's really able to put that alignment between middle school and high school in order to meet those needs. So thank you so much for your hard work. Thank you. So right now we're going to shift over to our science and we're going to have um, um, Mr. Um, Chris Jensen joining Matt Robinson to discuss <laughs> our science results. All right, so here we go. Um, so 35% of our, of our students met or exceeded standards on the NJSLA science as compared to 23% across the state. You know what, I'm gonna ask Mr. Jensen, would you wanna speak a, bit of, a little bit about this just because as far as the history behind the science test and how and as far as it used to be a field test and how you know, it's traditionally, as far as you see a bio test end of year, and how this really is something I won't say new. Do you want so to? For a really long time, it was a, a bio test that the school really never went anywhere. So we went through giving the test for 10 years, and nothing ever really happened in scores. We looked at them internally, but it was just for bio because bio is 
the main state requirement that's the one specific course that every given group has to have. So that was the that was the focus there. Um, and then in 2018, the 2018-2019, they ran this new test, which was a complete change from what we've done in the past. Um, you know, at that time, the scores were actually very similar. They're down a little bit. Currently, after COVID, I was kind of expected all over the place, but the scores were a very similar situation in that at that point as well. Um, and then we had two years off. Yeah, this is just looking at the district versus the state, which kind of looking at each different grade levels, which is the same overall, though. Right, so, yeah. you know, grade five, you know, perform well. Uh, our main focus is going to be kind of like a little bit of grade eight, other than that, kind of our area we're lagging behind the most, which is, it's confusing to me because that is an incredibly strong group of teachers, so I feel that they should be one of our strongest groups. So, you know, we're going to dive in a little bit more there. I have some ideas which we'll try to talk about. Okay. And the thing is, just want you to point out how across the state this test is a struggle, really, at the end of the day. Um, that you look at even, for example, in grade um, eight science, the, you know, the passing rate is 16%. Um, so to Mr. Jensen's point, this test has historically been, you know, a second thought at the end of the day, but certainly does not excuse as far as our continued um, needs to pay attention. And um, Mr. Mr. Robinson and Mr. Jensen are going to point um, out as far as some uh, um, next um, takeaways. Right, but absolutely. Oh, my God, of course. Just in general, um, it's traditionally science tests were very much read the content. You know, that's, that's one thing. Um, we knew it or didn't. Now it's, it's, very, it's very much a persistence-based test. Um, I'm pretty science savvy, but... The way the test is now, it takes me at least a half hour to get section. I was lucky to do it. Uh, I served on the testing committee for the state this past summer. So I was actually able to run through the test myself. It's the same one that was taken with the previous year. And it took me about a half hour. You have to, and it's different. It's, it's not really text-based either. It's, it's entirely diagrams, graphs. It's, so it's a, a different look in terms of what's kind of ever happened before. And it's even a, a little bit different than what we've kind of done in previous years or before COVID. So it's, it, it's constantly in flux because I'm pretty sure New Jersey's not happy with the overall pass score, pass rate. So it's going to continue to change as we go forward. So. Thank you. Yeah, and there you see our, our performance from 2019 compared to our performance in 2022. And obviously we split that. So for our next step at the elementary level, we selected new materials for instructional delivery in spring of 2021. We implemented them last fall. So it's hard to know, you know, as Mr. Jensen pointed out, the difficulty of this test, whether this is an implementation glitch because we went with a new program, or if it just due to the difficulty of the test and the difficulty of students had because we missed out on, on um, in class instruction. Um, but we did develop new curriculum in the program. <laughs> We devoted more time than ever science instruction in the elementary school schedule, which was 4 to 50 minutes per month, along with interdisciplinary opportunities for application of standards, whether it be in um, ELA or math. We have ongoing uh, PE opportunities for staff being sought, benchmarking opportunities for progress in science are being explored. We really want to speak to Lincoln, and I know Mr. Jensen will speak to this a bit more. Um, you know, we benchmark our progress on ELA and math, but we aren't doing so in science. And this is something we really want to work with them to try to um, pilot and work with them and, and really try to get something going here. And then we're incorporating the NJBOE digital item library for grade five with released test items um, just to get kids, kids exposure to what it looks like. So the middle school and high school, um, well, they're going to look very similar in terms of passion. Um, you know, a couple things that I learned from doing some from sitting on the committee for state uh, is that there, there are three main sections for science standards, but in terms of the, the priority of the state test, it's going to be the practices, the science practices, and then they're connected to the content piece. The practices are going to be the, the main priority where the, the students have to actually look at the data and analyze and determine what's going on. Um, so anyway, uh, they are focusing on three specific things in terms of, you know, the, the overall skills. So that's going to be sense making practices, critiquing practice, investigating practices. Um, we have been focusing in a couple of other areas before. Before this, we're going to have to we have to make a little bit of an adjustment. 
we go on the overall practices that we need to narrow down and use a little bit. Um, the other piece that was interesting is I I discovered uh, through the committee that there is, if you bury yourself in the state website, there's actually a testing report document or a technical report document where it actually will take you through a lot of their philosophy when designing the exam. So that was one of the things that we actually sat with for quite a bit with the committee. Um, so it's given me a lot better idea on you know, what's going to be expected going forward, so it's going to allow us to make those curricular changes. Um, one of those is going to be, you know, we're going to have to work with Lincoln. Currently, the item libraries don't exist. So, you know, we're going to have to start creating a lot of these items on our own, and we're also going to be borrowing from the release items that the state has, has put out there from previous staff. So any of the retired items every year, they're going to continue to grow this bank. So we're going to steal those and just use them in the curriculum where we can. Um, and that's, those are some of our main, our main targets that we're going to right now. Um, the middle school is also going through the first year of its new science curriculum. Um, now we went from a kind of a, uh, a model where they went to earth science, then they went into bio, bio, uh, biological sciences and then into the physical sciences. We kind of switched it to be more integrated, so now they're going to be kind of cycling through all different things, just so, so they're refreshing, but they're, they're able to you know, cycle their way up and see how things connect. So when we rolled this out, because of COVID and all the learning loss we expected, we decided we were just going to roll it out. Um, you know, we just, there was so much time lost already, so we figured the best way to do this was just to pull the bandaid off and go through. So we are going to see, um, we're going to see increasing scores this is a result of a new integrated curriculum. This the teachers are doing quite well with it. So you know, we're in a good place in terms of forward motion. The high school is going to be pretty much all the same. So. so we kind of just a little bit backwards. We actually had then start to look at the demographics analysis with respect to science. So when we're looking at Reese, I'm going to go back to the. Yeah, and here we see our race breakdown. <clears throat> our, our Asian students outperformed everyone else, um, followed by our white students, and um, you know, we performed so our black, Hispanic, and, and, and multiple race students lacking, as we did in the other areas as well. Um, and I'll speak to that there. Um, we, we also lack historical performance of the subgroups on NJSLA science. We're really working with the security and logic. And as we continue to administer this in you know, successive years, we'll have more and more to go along. Um, our distribution by achievement level for female and cap, again, that's, that's nothing that's really that significant there. Um, and the male category is by, by more percent. Based on program, to take a look, our ESL students and special education students really, uh, truly struggled with this assessment. Um, so again, that's something we really want to take a look at, how to integrate some of these um, science-type concepts into the ESL, ELL curriculum. I think it would be a good first step, exposing them to that um, domain-specific kind of language. I think it would really help, um, and working with our special educators to bolster the point as well. Similar to what we talked about. You know. And certainly one of the things I want to acknowledge here is Mr. Jensen is so heavily active beyond the um, outside the district of um, navigating um, the science of, um, you know, work, really, that he has developed great relationships. As you pointed out, he had worked um, at the state, you know, reviewing the exams over the summertime. So he is a wealth of information for us to get a handle of how to prepare our students. And certainly, um, you know, between... Um, you know, um, the various supervisory lead teachers, they work so well together that certainly, you know, sometimes, you know, across the departments, there's the same level of expectations and, you know, um, growth that we're hoping to see. And what they all mention, which I'm really excited about, is the idea of curriculum. And certainly one of the goals that we had as we started this school year, as you saw with the PE and health curriculum, we're trying to ensure that our curriculum is reflective of the classroom practices really at the end of the day, so that we have a clear articulation of whether you teach at Sanshore or CMS 
tints or mountain view that our students are getting the same experiences and even regardless of what teacher you have at the middle school or the high school. So really making sure that we have a, a great clear expectations for our curriculum writing. So we're going to be really developing a plan that we're going to um, essentially revise most of our curriculum over the course of the next three years in order to make sure that they are meeting and addressing the concerns that we've seen in these areas of testing. So once again, I wanted to thank both um, uh, Leo Bogosiak, uh, Mr. Lucid, and Mr. Jensen for their um, tremendous work, um, as well with, as well with Mr. Matt, Rob Matt Robinson, who's been working with our elementary um, um, staff from K-12. to We are now going to trans um, transition over to the MJGPA. The NJGPA is our, um, our high school um, performance test that was given to 11th grade students this past spring. This is the first time this test is ever administered. And certainly um, the two components, ELA and mathematics, and this is, was to um, ensure that our students were high school ready. And if you're older, it is a GPA, HESPA, um, you know, when you look at it, they just rename it to the GPA, and this is the first time. And certainly, um, when it was originally passed, it was supposed to be a high school requirement. However, um, many people petitioned, and then it's over the summer, that it was only going to be a field test. So we really do not have much data for this, because this is the first time this test was ever administered. And certainly, what we're going to share with you is what we can share with you. However, um, it's not until um, you know pre uh, upcoming um, grade levels that this test may potentially be expected to be the test in which students are going to be required to pass um, high school. Um, this is a little different. You know, they divide into two different buckets. So whether they are not yet high school ready, which is considered your level one and two, versus high school proficiency, which is levels three, four, and five. If you go back to NJSLA, those who are considered <laughs> passing were levels four and five, but the data that we're going to review are considered the first three levels. That is what the state is designating as, um, you know, meeting the expectations to graduate. So when we look at ELO, ELA here, you're looking at this um, light purple is lo looking at the students who are not ready to um, graduate. As you can see from the state pers um, um, our district perspective, about 64% of our students were deemed um, ready to graduate versus the state average here. And certainly when you break it down between our female and males, our male, our females, once again, tend to outperform our males as seen with the NJSLA. And certainly, um, you know, the reason why we can't break down these numbers, I dashed them out, because anything that's under 10, it's embargoed. We can't talk about that just because it could be identifiable for a student. So the breakdown versus graduation ready versus um not graduation ready was too small, so we can't um, publicly share that information. However, the two groups that we're able to is looking at um, our Hispanic as well as our white population. When you look at our economic disadvantage, once again, we can't break down that number because it's so small between the two. And certainly the only area that we can look at is five or fours, which is looking at about 66% of our students. And once again, our ELL population, we're unable to share that due to the embargo being under number 10. So we can see that a lot of majority of students did pass. Um, it does give us pause that, you know, if this test is required for high school graduation, we're looking close to about 39% of our students who would be in areas of need for remedial help. In some cases, when you look at remedial help, that looks at um, the requirement to fulfill a portfolio for graduation requirements, as well as, long as other measures. And the state is certainly looking to make ad adaptations to ensure also other pathways for graduation, whether it be achievement on other NJSLA testing and or um, tests like as such as SAT and PSATs. Um, as you recall, for the past previous years, that's what the state had implemented because there was no high school gra um, graduation signal or test, but there's different um, buckets in which they can do that. So we talk about mathematics. You know, looking at our um, district average, still we're looking at it's about 64%. Um, you know, our female and male um, achievements is very similar as far as passing is concerned. And once again, we're looking at our breakdown of um, achievement is similar across all different subgroups here. Um, but once again, we do, because we're able to share this information, you know, our, um, economic disadvantaged students are looking at a passing rate of only 38%, which does give us pause. Because once again, if they do not pass this test, they're technically not allowed to graduate, but the state does have a various pathways of um, um, success. 
So that is our GPA. And once again, that's not much more I can share with you because it's the first year of the test. And that's certainly something that we're looking at to uh, make sure that we move forward and to get a little more information from the state. Um, the other test we're going to be looking at is access trials. I'm going to turn this back over to Mr. Matt Robinson. He is our ELL coordinator for the district as well. All right, thank you. So uh, I just want to give you a little background on uh, our ELL population and uh, a little bit about how we're, how we're growing and where we need to go. So we utilize an ESL approach. That's our language instructional educational program, or FIP. <laughs> uh, we have a bilingual waiver, which means that we do not offer bilingual classes for our students um, because it would be burdensome for the district to um, you know, send these children all to one location, Uh, but we do offer high intensity ESL for an additional 30 minutes or a period at the middle of high school level per day in order to fulfill the late waiver requirement. Um, students receive instruction in team of awareness, phonics, reading, comprehension, writing, speaking, and listening during their daily 30 minute or period on the ESL block. And it doesn't supplant e e e e ELA instruction to fill in there um, with their peers for ELA instruction. What you should know about our community is we represent 27 different countries in our ESL population, including 34 unique languages. And a total of 164 students will be accessed for ELA test last year, including students who are waived per code. Parents are allowed to waive their children out of the program, which means that they simply sign a waiver, but they still have to take the access test each year for the waiver process. Um, and although students under fluctuate throughout the school year based on entrance, exit, and transfer, 38 more students took the access for ELs in 2022 than in 2021. So our numbers are rapidly increasing. If you take a look at the end counts up there, you can see the amount of students who took the access test over the past five years, and you see that our highest number by far was last year. Um, you also see our performance levels. Um, worthy of note is um, the breathing <laughs> category is where students exit the program. So you're not really going to see any students hitting that reaching category. Because once they hit bridging, they hit that 4.5 mark when they're allowed to exit the program. So last year's step, we developed and implemented a new ELL curriculum in grades K through five, and we evaluated student population trends and we hired a new ESL teacher who's being shared currently with Tim from CMS. And certainly, as Mr. Mr. Robbins pointed out, our ELL population is continuing to grow, and it's so diverse, right? When you look at it, when you look at that, this number, 27 countries, 34 unique languages. And that's it's something that we should be so proud of, that our students come from so many diverse backgrounds. But we also have a lot of work to do to make sure that these families are fully supported. Um, Mr. Rat Matt Robinson does host on um, um, family nights for these families in order to um, get um, familiar with the programs that we do have uh, aware and one of the big things that you know I even recall speaking with some people is sometimes um, because they're new to the country they don't know what questions to ask right and we have to be very mindful and thoughtful as to be very proactive with the community to ensure that we're providing them the necessary um, questions that to provide them for them for to be successful and that's something that Mr. Um, Robinson has been really keenly aware of in order, whether it be um, the translations of um, district communication so that they can be a regular um, active role in their child's education, even though they not may have not experienced it themselves firsthand. So, you know, we're doing our best and we're, we're looking to continue to welcome these families to the, um, our, our school community because they certainly make us, you know, very unique in Morris County. Thank you so much. Sure, yeah, and um, we're going to continue moderating the presentation of the curriculum. I'm going to make a recommendation that we um, go out to hire a, another ESL teacher for next year because the one who we hired, her, her roster is already full um, completely. So, um, you know, she's working at max capacity right now and we're still working to develop and mentor her. Um, she's a brand new teacher, but she's very good. Um, she speaks Arabic, which is great access for our community as well. Um, so, and I want to reevaluate our current model. Do we need a bilingual model? And we have a, a, a large Hispanic population at this point. Could we offer them a, a bilingual program? That's something we're going to explore. And I'd like to try to expand time dedicated to this instruction as well. I also want to streamline the home language survey process. Currently, that home language survey is given via real time and it's pushed out. I would like to try to do a, a 
face-to-face, in-person, online exposure. I think that would be very attractive. Mm -hmm. One thing that I'll have to work with our district budget for our administration on is trying to make sure that we can facilitate that. Well, one of the things I do want to recognize is Mr. Robinson. He actually is the one who proactively asked to take over the ELL program from a K to 12 perspective. You know, um, often you're dealing with similar families, whether it be K to 5 or 6 to 12, and he felt it would be um, prudent or our part to have the one contact point person for that. So I really do commend him for taking on that added responsibility because he really was um, meeting, wanting to meet the needs of our families um, in the ELL population. So thank you so much for that. And the last thing I'm going to talk about really briefly, and I'm going to wrap it up, is our dynamic um, learning maps test, also known as a DLM. Um, this is where uh, a test is given to our most significantly cognitively disabled students, um, uh, whom general state assessments are not appropriate, um, even with their accommodations. And so basically, it's looking at what they can do, the areas of ELA, math, and science. And certainly, these are not your traditional tests. They're done in simple, multi-step processes. They're called testlets in which they are um, given these tests. And certainly, when you look at the scores on DLM, they range from emerging to advanced. Understand that um, because our numbers are so small with respect to our DLM, we can't publicly share them because they're under the cusp of 10. But certainly, we do have a very um, highly effective um, special um, services department between the state Act as well as Ms. Um, um, Deb Huffman, who's working with our student populations to ensure that we are continually um, monitoring their growth, um, whether it be achievement on um, the DLM or rather they're making sure that they achieve their goals on their IEP. Um, and that kind of concludes our um, presentation on state assessment. But as I shared the last time is the fact that we are dedicated to ensure that our students are looked at as more than one test. And this is going to be done in a collaborative way. And I'm so thankful and fortunate to have a really great administrative team as well as um, keeping staff who is dedicated and willing to make sure the work is done to meet the needs of our, all our students across the district. So thank you. Thank you. I do have a question. Sure. Um, several years ago, the state put out a report. I don't, I don't think they do it anymore, but it was a transit, transiency report. Uh, and in our district factor group, we were one of the top. I would think that would be a mitigating factor. If we get a kid in here in third grade, you're giving them a fourth grade or seventh grade, give them an eighth grade. We haven't had a chance with our curriculum to teach those kids. You have one kid can change, can skew that by several percentage points. Has that been taken into consideration? It has, and we actually, and we didn't dive as far into that. As, we, we could have been here all night, you know, but we do have a cohort analysis that we utilize as well, and we track cohorts of kids who have been together over the course of years, and, and that would um, remove, you know, any new transfers in to that cohort. So the team, the team can move by the amount of education, their schooling versus those who come, you know, in and out of our district. So we do have that data as well. Great. That's great. Thank you. Anything else? Um, the last thing I did want to mention is our, was our first Lego League um, competition this past weekend, in which we had, I believe, Ms. We Met was actively involved in that this weekend. About uh, close 80, 80 schools, 80 teams. Uh, across the board, and certainly uh, we the the, um, the high school was um, was driving with um, kids, students coming in and out, and certainly the work not only of our, uh, our own personal um, um, students, but certainly the whole organization as well. It was you know incredible the pictures that were shown and how well organized um, the efforts were um, by our own staff to make sure that it took um, off without a hitch really at the end of the day. And I don't know, meant did you want to share anything as far as? Thank you.
just a, just a quick comment. And for the students uh, who helped put the first Lego League together and was doing a Cupid Shuffle, I have that on video. <laughs> you make an appearance on Twitter. It was, it was very nice to see the students enjoying themselves before the actual competition. And it just lets you know that they are passionate about what they're doing. They're just not just there because they have to be there. They're there because they want to be there. And they have to talk. But I do have the video. So. <laughs> That's it. Real quick, Dr. Banjo, I'd like to thank you and the instructional supervisors and your instructional team for that presentation. I know um, years ago, I think it was 2009, um, when people voted on the budget and our budgets went down pretty consistently, the board um, you know, it didn't want to cut teaching staff members, so we cut our department chairs. We called them department chairs at the time. I think over the past, since 2016, 17, this board has made it a point to bring back our curriculum supervisors, which is, the, in my opinion, one of the most important positions outside the su superintendent, the assistant superintendent or curriculum director that district can have to really focus in on our, on our, on our <laughs> curriculum. I think you need district our size, you need curriculum specialists. And I, I just want to say what a great job everyone did tonight with that. Thank you. Yes. I wholeheartedly agree. Anyone else? Thank you. Dr. Giordano, you still have the Thank you. I'm going. I'm going to keep rolling here. My, my laptop's under a... Uh, there's some issues there, some maintenance. Um, so, no, no, Ms. Ms. Uh, uh, Narcisse was kind enough to pull up the okay. committee report. Um, so it was myself, um, Ms. Fan, uh, myself, um, Ms. Aquino, Dr. Gales, Mr. Robinson, uh, Dr. Bangia, and Dr. Kreider. Um, first off, Dr. Kreider presented the results of the last two job fairs. Um, they were held here. Um, she gave us the numbers, which I had written down. I, I left my notes of, of, of staff members we were able to hire from those job fairs. Um, she presented the tentative plans for the spring recruiting, uh, which includes job fairs at local colleges um, with an emphasis on, you know, uh, trying to cast our net to diversify our staff. So um, we're looking at a lot of what historically called urban schools, Kane, William Patterson, um, to get out there and really recruit those students or even for student teaching to come out uh, to Mount Olive. Um, the use of Handshake, which is a, what is it? it's an app, isn't it? It's, a, it's, a, it's an app or it's a platform. The platform, thank you, I couldn't remember. Um, and an employment opportunities page that will be on our new website um, to really get, get people involved when they come on our website, make it nice and easy, they can see the jobs front, uh, uh, front, uh, front and center. Uh, Dr. Gills asked about uh, who would be attending the on-site fairs. Uh, that's yet to be determined based upon our staffing needs. Um, so Dr. Craig will follow back up um, with that. Uh, Dr. Banja discussed staffing roles and staffing needs um, over break and in January. Uh, she will be looking, um, as she always has been, uh, with Dr. Kreider to see how we can more streamline and, 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 and make those roles more efficient. Um, of note, uh, Dr. Gales brought this up, a clarification that has since been broken out. Um, the board, if they look at the salary adjustments for our um, security officers, um, it's there are different rates on their ability to carry firearms. Uh, so we, we broke that out before it wasn't broken on the agenda. Um, and all action items were reviewed and approved and supported by the personnel committee. Did I miss anything? Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Gales, curriculum committee. Thank you. The curriculum committee met on December 5th at 5 o'clock. Present were Mr. Kevin Moore, Ms. Deborah Huffman, Ms. Karen Spacek, Ms. Fenton, Ms. Mrs. Narcee, Dr. Kreiner, and myself. Uh, Mr. Moore began the meeting by discussing the Holocaust trip, which will take place between March 8th and March 18th. There are 24 students scheduled to attend the field trip, and many of the uh, students from last year are included in that group. There will also be four chaperones. The board has been asked to approve transportation to Newark Airport. One of the, the topics that was discussed is board liability, and it was determined that this is an EF Tours excursion and not a Board of Education sponsored trip. And moving forward, any EF Tours activity will take place off school ground. Mr. Moore also mentioned that parents have purchased the full trip insurance and he's met with parents and that they don't have any concerns about uh, their children attending the trip. We also discussed uh, high school scheduling recommendations for 23-24. And so the, for the rising ninth graders is going to be the implementation of a math and ELA assessment as a data-informed approach to more accurately schedule students entering into their freshman year. Parents can still review course requests and either accept or request a change in the recommendation. 
It, it was discussed uh, placing students in appropriate classes for the onset of their high school career to help to ensure student success and decrease class failure. Uh, Ms. Stasak and Ms. Huffman uh, presented a Google slide on the overview of the special education program, class sizes, services offered, and personnel needs across the district, which is very informative. Our technology committee update has been moved to January of next year. And uh, we took a cursory look, at which we had a more in-depth presentation today, of the district data on student achievement. And overall, we noted that our achievement declined compared to previous years due to COVID. However, we continue to outperform the state in many areas. And um, during the curriculum committee meetings moving forward, we look forward to hearing the recommendations for addressing the achievement gaps and opportunity gaps for our groups of students that are performing well. Our Freedom of Lunch, our ELL, our Special Needs, our Black and Hispanic students. We look forward to hearing that in committee. And uh, to my colleagues, if I missed anything, please feel free. Okay. A quick question, Dr. Dr. Gills. Um, and maybe this is more for Mark, not so for, so for you. So since it's not a BOE-sponsored event, these, these trips, do we have to approve it as a BOE? We're not li liable for it. Probably not. I would check with our risk manager. Okay. Well, not during a school break. How is that not a school trip? So just some questions I've already written down, so I will follow up with them. Risk manager, yeah, I, yeah, I just, if, if we're not liable for it, then why do we have to approve it? Yeah, to control the general policy, too. Okay. This question. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Weaver, before you get started, let me just set my timer. <laughs> <laughs> I think I beat her tonight, though. Yeah, so. yeah, I started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Just, I just want to know if that's a dib at her or a dib at me. I'm, just, I'm trying to figure that out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Can I, can I elaborate on something? Um, Mrs. We Met noted that the security budget after, uh, with actual Sir October is looking like it's going to be $150,000 over budget. I think I feel the need to explain that just so everybody in the public understands what's going on. I did not under budget. Unfortunately, the budget was approved before Uvalde happened. And with Uvalde, it put a real different spin as every time one of these unfortunate events happens. Um, we, we go back and we look at security. So um, what has happened since then is obviously there's an increase in security and security is at every event. So that was post budget. 
So I just want to make sure everybody understands that and what we're doing for 23-24 is I've asked each of the buildings to work with Mr. Carifi to determine exactly how much they will need in security staffing for their events for next year. So I just want to make sure that everybody understands it wasn't a missed budget. It was just um, life. I'm sorry. Just to be clear, that's strictly personnel? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Creepy, how many do we have now? About 12 security officers? 14. 14. Okay, thank you. Just, just a side note. We we were one of the first districts ever had security officers. Uh, the town got a grant, and uh, we were able to put an officer in the middle school and the high school. And they were going to pay half, and we paid half. The next year, they stopped paying, but we kept them going, and we kept increasing, increasing. I think, as you know, we, we received the best sacred school district in the county, so it, it's certainly worth it. I, I know the parents are happy about it. Any other questions for Mrs. Lina? Uh, I just have a comment. Um, and I'm sure I'm just kind of being kind of a bit more but that ad hoc for the referendum. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that. All right. Anybody else? Do you have any uh, policy committee meetings? Mr. Stern? Uh, no. Do you have any PTA or subcommittee reports? Hello, I'm Jennifer Shortino, and I'm the high school Tampa president. We had our second meeting last Tuesday night. It was virtual, and we did have some technical hiccups, but we got through it. Everybody was really accommodating. Uh, we had student council rep come, and the two reps came. They were wonderful to give us updates on past events and also on some future events that are going on with the high school. Uh, gave us like the Prom dates in May 25th where the senior parents will appear with soon. It's important to um, <laughs> Mr. Feltman gave a great presentation on the upcoming scheduling process for our parents. And uh, we'll have them have them back to you because I know there's some change going on on the website. So we might be going over that for our parents. Our membership is going well. Um, our next fundraisers are the senior signs, which we need to program in February. Plus, we're going to try to sell some of the pencils after school on uh, certain dates. We're trying not to step on toes of other groups that are selling stuff after school. So we're working on that. And our next meeting is in the morning Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Tara Kovach, Tins Road PTO. Uh, last month, earlier this month, our STEAM night was an amazing success. Um, we had 100 or so students and families that were engaged and working together on fun projects for a little over two hours. We saw lots of confused looks, but more importantly, we saw lots of smiles and heard lots of laughter. We can't thank Kamali and her team from Zebra Robotics for everything that they brought to show us. I know a lot of you guys were, were in attendance and including the uh, district administration um, everything that happened in that cafeteria was donated and supported by Zebra Robotics, which was amazing. Um, and then they, she also extended a $50 off coupon to all of our family members, families that wanted to um, attend a class at her school. Yes. Um, Erica Marcinko is our social media queen and our theme enthusiast. She brought that idea and made that and executed it wonderfully. She set up 10 stations in our gym where students played math games, built circuits, made and tested um, paper airplanes, and a whole lot more. Um, I would like to thank our TINS teachers, Mrs. Hun, Ms. Caruso, and Ms. Mathura, and our middle school students for helping with all those stations. Um, it was a lot of fun. This was such a hit with parents, students, and administration. And with budget talks and curriculum being discussed right now, I encourage you guys to try and figure out how to incorporate more STEM in our elementary schools. I know we have a lot of great things at the middle school and the high school level, but by fourth grade, kids know whether they like science or not. Um, so it's really important. And I'm not suggesting you tell the teachers to figure out how to incorporate it into their curriculum, because they're already jam-packed. But I definitely think we need more science in our school, our already long school day. Um, 
Our November Friday giveaway was candles and individual pies for all the teachers and staff members. Um, that was done right before um, Thanksgiving break. We'd like to thank Mrs. Otteson for showing our teachers how grateful we are for them. Uh, movie night. Movie night was last Friday, and that was bananas. Last week, we showed minions to a packed house. It was incredible how many people showed up. Um, our committee went all out. They had minion t-shirts, minion candy bags. They had a red carpet appearance and which, with minion cutouts, and it also included a surprise visit by an inflatable minion for photo ops. That was a big hit for all the kids. Our holiday shop kicked off today, and it's another outstanding job by Nikki Otteson and her team. Nikki shopped, stored, and priced all of our items at her home and did an amazing job getting a great variety of quality items at affordable prices for all of our student shoppers. That's all I have for today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, hello, my name is Lauren Fitzgerald. I am the president of the Sandshore SHSB. Um, so I wanted to give you guys a quick update, you know, um, tell you what we've been up to really for the past three months. Um, so we have finished up a membership drive where we had all of the different classes compete every week to see how many different SHSB memberships we could raise. We ended up with about 200, which is one of my favorite mm -hmm. Um, and the winning class, actually none of the winning classes, we tied, got uh, gift certificates to Sunday, so I'd like to show them up here. Um, so that was our membership drive. Then we moved into our book fair. That raised about just under $10,000 this year and also restocked our um, book vending machine, which you guys can see in action. Um, it's in the Sandshore lobby. I don't know if you've seen it, but definitely stop by. It's a lot of fun. So we've restocked that as well. Um, the other uh, item that we did, obviously, trunk or treat, which again, sugared up a bunch of kids, over 1,000 pounds of candy given out, um, which to the parents' dismay, um, <laughs> that was a successful event as well. And we actually just finished our holiday shop last week. Um, it was a full week-long event. We also had a friends and family night, Thursday night, um, where uh, not only did we have um, families who could come in and shop, but we had some of our Sam Short alumni come in and shop with the kids, which is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Sixth, like seventh, and eighth graders came back and gave their time to the kids, so that was great. Uh, Squishmallows were the big seller this year, so if your students shopped at our shop, I'm really sorry, there's your gift. And I did want to also say um, about the Lego League, how cool that was. We did, Sam Shore did have a team, a fifth grade team, wanted to say, um, the parents asked us mm -hmm. to say a big thank you to um, both Dr. Gales and Ms. Rometh for being there. Um, that was noted, they love taking pictures of you guys, you guys are kind of famous apparently to them. But they also wanted me to tell you um, a little bit about the Sandshore Lego Leagues um, project. So it was obviously the state championships, but the team was tasked with building and coding a Lego robot to complete uh, seven missions and an innovation project. So the group's innovation project was a concept for a solar powered swing at Sandshore School for the physically handicapped. Um, and so this weekend's competition consisted of three runs to complete their missions, and the Sandshore team finished with a high score of 205. So uh, many thanks to our coaches, Devin Marquez and Roberta Justo, for their guidance and dedication. The students met twice a week, every week since October. So, uh, so that's what's going on at Sandshore. I wanted to give you two other updates about um, just elementary PTAs, new things that are happening for us this year. Um, one of the things that the PTAs have started doing at the elementary level is the presidents have all been meeting together from each of the elementary PTAs to work a little smarter and harder to figure out, you know, what are some ways that we can optimize. If we're doing a dance one weekend, do you want to use the decorations for the next weekend so that we're all really just trying to work together? Mm -hmm. so got it. Um, and so that's been really helpful. We need a jersey person. Um, but then the other thing that we um, has really been helpful this year that we're really appreciative of is um, we are having monthly meetings with Dr. Bangia and Mr. Robinson where we are able to talk about all things, with, you know, uh, everything from fifth grade, things that we're going to get ahead of, so it's not an issue, um, and we're going to um, all the different events coming up as well as any parent issues. And we really appreciate you guys taking your time and you're busy to sit and have that meeting and talk about those elementary um, issues that parents may have. And for us, I'll answer updates. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I have two reports. Um, first one I'm going to come out there for. Uh, 
So long. Actually, we built the board, I think Franklin built the board. <laughs> <laughs> actually, we came out of board in 1989, over three decades ago. Um, one of the things about Bill and I is we don't always agree on everything, but we're old school. We talk to one another, we confide in one another, we tell one another's opinions to one another, and then we respect one another. I hope this board can finally grasp that same concept. And I know they will eventually. Bill and I go, go have been through an awful lot together. But there's one thing about Bill that no one else is going to have. Because Bill's legacy is going to be the student board member. There is no one before or after who has attended more student functions than Bill Robinson. It's sad that he's leaving the board, but he's not leaving the community. Bill will still be involved in the referendum, of which he was with two other communities, and he'll be always there to give us guidance to the good council. So with this, I'd ask Bill to come up here, if you would. <laughs> Children for 30 years. It's been a hell of a ride, I'll tell you. Thanks for the memories. Thanks to all the staff that's been here. And I got to see one of the best go today. Uh, very, uh, yeah, that was the other great thing. And uh, it was wonderful to see him and, and you know, tell him that my son said that he made me such a difference. In his life because of the piano. And my son's been a pianist for 35 years now, I guess. But it's it's difficult for me to leave like this. But um, I'm glad I don't have to remember all the stuff that was said tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't too little much for me, I'll tell you that. But um, what do you say? I mean, you know, for, for something like this, it's just. I got the most out of it, I think, and, and I learned one one thing, and I, I think everybody here has heard it more than once, is that what we are about is the kids. And if we're smart enough to do what the kids really can get a hook into, we'll do better with all their other classes. And we have learned that the last couple decades and it really works because then if we if the kids are happy teachers are happy parents are happy i mean that makes all the difference in the world we're all, you know and it makes us proud look what we did we went from the lower 20 percent in Lawrence county to the upper eight percent in the nation as far as what we do. And we did not aim for any of that. We just aimed to make it right. And what was said tonight about the elementaries, I absolutely agree, but we had agreed on that 
quite a while ago. So we can start in the high school, see what works, move it down to the middle school, see what works, then move it down to the elementary schools. I think we can pause on that last part of it. I hope that everybody gets back to that again. And I want to thank you for this, and thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. My other thing I'd like to talk about is, is the referendum. Uh, we've seen in the paper <clears throat> several schools are going out for referendums coming here. A lot of them need building work and so on and so forth. Um, I was able to see a brief copy of the demographic study that was just done. <clears throat> and I, this is my concept of the demographic study. It's, it's part uh, fact and part assumption. And I'll just give you an example uh, because I've seen the latest one in 2021, and I and I referred back to the, my copy of 2019. The 2019 population that they listed was uh, 29,051. In the new uh, demographic study, they're telling me in 2020. The population was 28,886, so we lost some people. Now, these are estimated figures, of course. Uh, they're saying in the 2019 study, in, in 2040, about 30,146 people. And in the new study, they're telling us we're going to have 29,922. So you can see it keeps varying. It keeps jockeying back and forth. So we have to remember that when we look at it. Now, according to them, in our 2019 study, the 2024-25 school year, pre-K, we will have a little over 2,000 students. We'll have just a little low, almost 1,100, and we'll have 1,450 high school students. The new one says we're going to have 2,200 students in, in elementary. We're going to have about 1,100 and change, just maybe about 30 people more, in six and eight. And we're going to have about another 50 extra in the high school. So right off the bat, that tells me we have to be concerned with elementary because that's where we have our biggest deficit. They're saying our capacity of each school, which I do not agree with, but that's the capacity that they're coming up with, is 1,954 capacity for UK to 5, 1,153 for 68, for 6 to 8, and for 9 to 12, 1,533. Now, we built the middle school to hold 1,400 students and the high school to hold 1,600. However, we call capacity. Remember, it's the amount of seats we have for kids, and a lot of those facilities are now being used for something else. So we've lost some, some room. Um, with the new developments that are being built, the, uh, the two in ITC and the other one, uh, they're saying that that should yield us uh, by 2025 or, or later, about an additional 600 students. No, I'm sorry, they're, they're having 600 units. It should uh, yield us another 340 students. So this is what we're going to have to look at as far as the referendum goes. Now, we will, come the first of the year, really get on this, and we'll, have, we'll get this ad hoc committee going. And I would love to have not only administration and some board members, but I'd like to have representation from all levels of our school district with staff. And I'd also like to have community members. So if there's any community members who'd like to volunteer, please get in touch with me, because this is going to have to be a big referendum. We will get a good portion from the state, I'm sure, but it's still going to have to be a, a good-sized referendum because we're going to have to first look at classroom capacity. Uh, that's going to have to be the first thing we're going to have to look at. But the second thing we're going to have to look at is buildings and grounds because we need our roofs are in bad repair. And you just can't put that amount of money into a one-year budget. That has to go into a referendum. So we'll start there, and then we'll start with speaking with everyone else, go out from there. But we will definitely next year have to go out to a referendum because our other bond issue is maturing so we can carry it right over without having a very heavy tax in on our, on our uh, community. So that's it on the referendum. Um, I will now open up to the public for any comments they have on any action item.
Morning Rolls only 24 weeks or South Point in New Jersey. Speaking of referendum, you know, I mentioned to people that it would be nice if we put a new high school and put a state of the art high school. Now, I won't ever do that with that. My kids will be out. But by putting a brand new state of the art high school, it frees up the current high school and the middle school to facilitate a lot of the growth that's coming. And you're right, the growth comes probably even more from what's even in that report. Um, it's like a, a building frenzy where people with mobile housing, condos, townhomes, uh, they have an extra answer to home. If you have a home, there are children, but when you add multi dwelling properties, it, it's an exponential higher number. So, you know, I don't, do we know what the, the, what the, what the total is coming off referendum, what we had last time? Yeah, we originally had a $40 million referendum. Okay. So, if it was me, I'd like to be part of that committee if possible. I would like to say that we shoot, go shoot, either go big or go home. This is the future of the town. And if you don't have a school system, in that fashion, that would be my recommendation. Well, one of the factors that's going to play into that is our bonding capacity. You know, we may not have the bonding capacity to do, to do that. Well, that, that's something that can be worked out. Yeah, we are, we're, we're looking at everything, yeah. But like you said, you know, I mentioned someone that land across the street from the high school on the other side um, by Sanchez and Rolling Road that land. So you wouldn't have to rebuild the football stadiums, you wouldn't have to rebuild the soccer dome. The goal would be close in the same proximity. Which would also save a lot of money. They are able to make quite proximity on that. One of the things, too, Mark, we're going to have to look at, and we've seen it, Bill and I have seen it over the years, is we have to be careful how big we go. Because we could have a moratorium and then start a downgrade, which has happened in Precipity and a few other places. Um, one of the things that, although we're contributing to more, we've gotten more students in, there's a couple of mitigating factors whereby we're keeping it lower. A, we're graduating almost 400 kids a year out of our system as we're taking some in. And two, we are getting people to move into the district, but we are also having families that have had their last child in the district and are now just living there. They're not moving, they're staying there, but they're not contributing. They're not contributors. So, yeah, well, so that all has to be played in. It's just not just a believe me, we put a lot of work into the last two referendums. It was a lot of work, but we were not. Met with people all over the place and explained everything to them. So we'll, we'll, we'll work on it. I'll be an advocate for that, for that good proponent of education for kids in general. Now, in, in regards to what Regina talked about with school bus fines and violations, we're on there and you're going to have to pull the teeth at a town council. And I, I talked to some people there saying, hey, you know something, how about reimburse the cost of it? You're not going to, if you don't want to give the school district the money because you want to keep everything to yourself. How about reimburse the system? Some people are under the perception that it was done under a grant. I can inform that it wasn't done under a grant. Okay, so if it wasn't done a grant, have them put the cost to the system to pay for it and then pay for the ongoing maintenance and support. Because that would alleviate a burdensome from the town, from, from Mount Olive. And that would be a great solution if they won't give you the actual dollars. Make it the fact that they have to cover the expense for maintaining and operating the system. And with the help with the cost of taking for these things expense out of the system. At least that would reduce the budget and expense and that other money can be spent elsewhere mm -hmm. on the children. But I will fight with the town council and them on this as well because the first day it came out, the first what I asked, where's the revenue going, right? It'd be nice if the revenue from the coming back to the school district. Now it's not about the money, it's really about the safety of the children. But the amount of work that we have to put in to follow all the reports is great in time and he is valuable. He's not necessarily the handsomest man, but he's definitely valuable. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so like I said, I think that's when you first pursue this, I will back them up 110% to do this with the town council and the members there as well. Now, in regards to Daniel that you mentioned, they're going to have services on Saturday at 12 30 with Daniel. Uh, Daniel was a friend of mine, and was, I, was, I found out first with a one public six person that was told about it. And I let some other people know that it was catastrophic what happened. He was just a kind soul. And that that did bother me. I'm trying to get the town to work on a more senior well check program because of the circumstances of, of him being what happened. And I think that's something that we have to work on and be cognizant. But I'm working on that also with the town. But you know, the other thing when I was going through action items, uh, we have something that actually in uh, 7.24 about retain people who sell the dome space. We can't do that internally. We can save the commission, but I have to pay someone for that. We pay more people. 
right. You talk about the supervisors? The supervisor, well, one thing. Yeah, there are have, people. Uh, pack, uh, pack with you. Is that an employee you can pick? Or is that, or is that no. no. But which one, which one is he talking about? 7425, 7425, it's just, it's, uh, I can jump in as well. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. It's, 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 we were discussing on how better to do that, take it in, take it in, in house with our okay. own people. Uh, just right now, they're continuing to do it for spring season as we try to develop a plan on to how we're going to take that in. Then it's the soccer club that you get very fortunate to Well, they, these yeah. people that, it was originally yeah. with, with our former, former super, with our former superintendent, Dr. Reynolds, where, you know, these people are well-connected in town. They have well connections with, with other outside sport programs. They would come and run our space. So that, that was the only thing behind it. But as we look to take it more on our own, um, we're just doing this as, as a stopgap. Okay. And then the other question I have, you know, I, I hate giving away free money. If you give away the old free money, $4,000 for the point car program. And I see we're turning down a grant. Uh, uh, refusal of the person grant. Why would we return or, or refuse a grant? Dr. Bandy, you want to check? Certainly. Um, the requirements for the Perkins grant adjusted this year. There's a different um, expectation as far as um, reports being um, developed. And unfortunately, um, said reports were not put together, thereby we had to we had no choice but to refuse funds for the Perkins grant. Okay, so we're not going to be able to meet the qualifications for the grant. Correct. Because we returned to the crazy grant two months ago, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. No, the swipe, that's a little different. That we're, we're looking at our um, ARP funds, but however, those funds are allocated to different um, parameters. So we never lost those funds. It was just they were put towards another um, um, issue or top area. But the, I don't want to be a dead horse with Mr. Horsemorse. I'm just confused on the whole grant myself. Like, to me, we would refuse the grant if we got the money. We never received the money. We made that clear. Yeah, we, never, we never received the money. We then why do we have to refuse the grant? Because that's a formality, because the state provided us the opportunity to um, get this money, and because we did not fulfill the um, requirements set forth by the state, we have by officially have to refuse the funds. And then we have to find the money in the budget, Mr. Beach, for that refusal. So we Correct. Have budget, right? Correct. To make that we would have accepted those funds for the public. Yes. I want to make that clear. Yes, we would have accepted. Uh, yeah, I think the word refusal should be changed. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to be eligible for it. No, it's just that's a proper terminology required by the state of New Jersey to uh, employ. That's the, you know, and Ms. Jones, am I correct? That's yes. a, yes. They make us do that. Yes. Okay, and then obviously I, I don't see anything about the legal expenses and all that stuff. Are you guys going to have a breakdown for what how can be proactive enforcement or what? For the ask for the increase of sixty five thousand dollars, mm -hmm. it will be actually at a nine point six approval of increase in legal expenses. So we can have a, a detailed breakdown of where those funds are going and for what. Certainly, we are budgeting accordingly. Those projects were based upon current costs up to this um, part of the school year. So we um, proportionally anticipate perhaps engaging that same amount of legal um, fees. But certainly, we're, we're um, working with the business office to ensure that we're working with those parameters in order to meet the legal needs of the district. And, uh, Mr. Weissmuller, so annually, when the budget is approved, there are professional service amounts that are set and approved at such time. So when the budget was done, legal was approved at $200,000. Unfortunately, as we're looking back through expenses that have come up to date that we were unprepared for, um, we have to plan accordingly. So just because I put in a resolution to increase that budget line from 200 to 65 does not mean that we are going to use it all. It's just a preventative measure. We could wind up not using it. We could wind up having to come back and need more. So it's just it's just a place marker to make sure that we're covering ourselves for the rest of the year. Correct. That's just based upon the actuals. Okay. That's okay. It. Thank you. Uh -huh. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah, no. Just to clarify something, um, on the referendums, the prior referendums, the middle school, the building, the middle school the referendum was for $40 million. And the addition and reparations to the high school was fifty million dollars. And uh, you know, as far as the population of, of of students, the last decade we've been within um, around all around forty 
2,700 students per year uh, within, say, 150 to 200 students on any given year. So we have not been all over the place, even though for the last couple of decades we've been told, told that, oh, yeah, we're building all kinds of houses and you're going to have all these problems and everything. Um, I'm not saying it'll never happen, but so far, so good. Um, we've been static. And I think what that is is mm. that some people are staying here, of course, people like me, who are staying here because we are Mount Olive. And, um, you know, we're not getting this rush of new people in with young kids all the time. So, um, I mean, there are things that we all have to take into consideration when we do the referendum. And, uh, and that's just one of the points. There's, you know, a hundred others, but that's just one. To add to that, I think we're going to be able to get a virtual report on the demographic study in January. There's um, actually lots of great data in this report. Um, some of the things that they reported were back in 03 when it was the peak of the housing market. There were 390 sales. Last year, there were 398. Mm -hmm. So back when they had the housing crisis, um, they had dropped down to like one. 68 in 2011. So it was steady for a while. And then last year, I mean, I sold in 2020. So, um, but you know, right around that, um, that time frame. the other thing they do mention is what they call this negative kindergarten. And what that means is the number of students graduating. So say it's 300 students, the number of kindergartners may be 250. So that's your negative kindergarten. I'd never heard that term myself. So I found it very interesting. So it's, it's an interesting number to look at, but as Mr. Strelacci said, Dr. Grip, who is from Statistical Forecasting, um, I'm going to be working with him to provide a virtual um, review of the report after our reorg meeting. So at that point, we'll have the opportunity to ask the questions and get the answers. But um, as Mr. Strelacci said, there's facts and then there's some stuff that's kind of a guesstimate, if you will. Real quick, Mr. President, and not to be a dead horse, I think it's also important for the community to understand the needs of our student population itself is growing. So what the needs of the students were 10, 15 years ago is not indicative of any report like that. Um, I'm sure you talk to any administrator, any school council in our district, uh, the needs of special ed directors, the needs of our students, the students coming in, are, are even our nurses. I'm sure on the nursing service plans, they can go through um, you know, the students' needs in each building. Um, so just keep that in mind as we look at these numbers. Not all the students are just a number of report. The needs of our population are growing because people are moving here for the services. So I want to keep that in mind for everybody. Well, just to give you, just not keep going, but just to give you a little more information. At one point in time, we had the capacity in elementary to teach 2,200 students. Now they're telling us our capacity is 1,954. We built the middle school for 1400 They tell us our capacity is 1153 We built the high school for 1600 Now they tell us the capacity is 1533 So you can see we have, we've lost space based on programs that have, have been involved. But also, just one thing quickly, the, you, you and I went out specifically because of special ed. We went to the elementaries just to see what was happening and what the problem was so we would be uh, better informed as to what we're looking at and that's what i was going to say before we have a lot of other things to look at anyone else okay mr queen would you please move the approval of monthly expenses sure. i'd like to make a motion to approve action items 6.1 through 6.8 Second. Okay. And discussion. Roll call, please. Mrs. Aquino? Yes. Mrs. Fenton? Yes. Dr. Gales? Yes. Dr. Giordano? Yes. Mrs. Narcisse? Yes. Mrs. Minette? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Zayer? Yes. Mr. Scalati? Abstain. Anything to do with uh, name Jody Bosch? Yes, and everything else? Dr. Giordano, personnel, please. Thank you, Mr. President. On the recommendation of the acting superintendent, uh, move personal action item 7.1 all the way down to 7.26. Second. Any discussion? Yes. Uh, we need to 7.27.9 and I'm going to make a comment. This is what's going to be for the spring on the amendment. Make it after the spring. Why do we need this for uh, the end of the year? 
uh, again, it's just to you. It was just, to, I mean, as, as Dr. Giordano said, the arrangements that were made prior were that they would be covered through this year and we would go back and then revisit this for the actual need moving forward for next school year. For this year. Yes. Yes. Anyone else? Okay, we'll call it, please. Dr. Giordano? Yes. Mrs. Narcisse? Yes. Mrs. Minette? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Desire? Uh, Fort Grant is being on 743. Uh, and Dr. 7.23. Mrs. Pino? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. 7.24 uh, 7 and 7.25. Mrs. Benton? Yes. Dr. Gales? Yeah. Mr. Tulachi? I have staying on 7.3 and 7.4, yes, under appeals. This is, no, Dr. Gales. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion upon the recommendation of the acting superintendent to move action items 8.1 to 8.7. Second. Discussion? Roll call, please. Dr. Gales? Yes. Dr. Giordano? Yes. Mrs. Narcisse? Yes. Mrs. Rina? Yes, and I'd like to say a nice word to Dr. and uh, Mrs. Hurt, who did the uh, nursing Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Desire? Yes. Mrs. Aquino? Yes. Mrs. Benton? Yes. Mr. Strzelacki? Yes. Mrs. Rina, finance, please. Second. Discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Minette? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Desire? Yes. Mrs. Aquino? Yes. Mrs. Benton? Yes. Dr. Gales? Yes. Dr. Giordano? Yes. Mrs. Narcisse? Yes. Mr. Strelachi. Yes. Okay, I'll open it up now to the public. Do you have any public comments or anything? Well, how are you doing with me again? Um, I have some stuff I want to have committed for the record. Can you put it in the All right, so I'll hand it over. I'm going to put it in the actual notes. And then I also have here a <coughs> on the document that I just want to see if it's on the board. Can you tell me what they are, please? I will. I'm going to get that in one second. All right. Um, first one is my copy of the email that I sent to the Board of Ed on November 4th. Uh, it had to do with conflict of interest for the Board of Ed attorney. Okay. All the members of the Mountain Board of Education got an over, I sent an email to, talk to all the board members. Is that correct that your board members received an email from me? Yes. Okay, in that email, let me put my glasses on here. I stipulated, uh, I received the following <laughs> message from a friend of a nearby town, and at first I wasn't sure what to do with it. I believe the four items of the American Bar Association pertain to current arrangement of what is that within um, it, it, after reading all of them. Now, I realize that most of you don't want to hear from me, but the amount of hours. Uh, and the taxpayers are what I care about, and the fate of a board that is rest in their hand. Now, I sent over four items, uh, which came from the American Bar Association. It has to do with conflict of interest and arrangements in the past and future. Now, as you all may know, if you're conflicted once with anyone, you're then conflicted in perpetuity. You can't unconflict yourself. It's there forever. Okay, and I'm sorry, in this situation, the board attorney is conflicted in this matter. And so that's why I sent you all the documentations. So what I want to do is I want to, I'd like to know if any of you have addressed this email at the whole board, and if so, have you taken actions to address this with the board that we will count it? We're not going to answer that. Okay, well, I figured that. Well, what I sent you was rule 1.7, conflict of interest of current clients. That simple one that was sent over today. Situationally, someone has been applying here and applying in every district. That's a current client. And or more than you know, hand in hand, you can't dispute that. Number two, Mr. Weiss, brother, we'll stop, stop, please. No, I'm. Not, I so want just to stop. Finish. Just stop there. A year and a half, you've been attacking this board. A year attacking, and a half, you've been attacking, attacking these members. I've had enough. That's okay. enough. I will finish my thing. And I'll you, you're not going to finish yet. 
I'll tell you why. If you have anything to say, address it to our attorney, take us to court, and we'll solve it. I'm tired of this back and forth stuff. If you actually address the email, then All right, go ahead, finish it, and that's it. Okay. And then the second one was rule number one point on duties of former clients, which is also sent all the So this is stuff that I said to you guys well ahead in advance of all this, so you guys be prepared for the future. You guys can choose to act on it or ignore it. Obviously, Mr. Schwab wants to ignore it. I don't. Okay? I want things to be held ethically, morally, and correctly. Very simple. Ethically, morally, and correctly. Okay? That's all I'm asking for. Next one is rule number 3.7. Lawyer has a right to tell. I have actually different all the information in there in the things we put into the man. So everything will be there verbatim, copied right from the American Association Bar Association. Okay? And the last one is rule number 1.13, organization as a client. All this stuff is relevant to the amount of work of patient and to this current situation. Okay? Now, because of the series of conflict with the Board of Education Attorney, I've hoped that the Board would have obtained special counsel in this matter. They're now giving that all the material that I presented on November 4th. Uh, you are responsible for protecting the Board's integrity, even if the attorney of the Board has a conflict of interest. It goes hand in hand with the Board member and or attorney. It's, it's one and the same, even if it was a teacher. So we treat everything to the highest <laughs> standards. That's all I'm asking. As you may be aware, there are ethical allegations with the board attorney and has a conflict of interest because he has actually recused himself in a different situation uh, with, a, with an employee who lives in a different town. And once you're conflicted, you're always conflicted. There's no going back. You can't undo a conflict of nature. All right? And Mark, you can answer that if you want. Can you? No, we got it. Okay. All right. And. Um, one of the final questions that I have about our policy, uh, the vendor events. And this is, do we have a vendor event? What's the board policy on spouses attending vendor events that are paid for by vendors? Do we have a policy on that? No. All right. No. So a vendor can spend money on spouses willingly without disclosing. Or superintendents or administrators. Well, they're, they're employees yeah. of the district. Yes. yes. Uh, they can spend on anybody now. they want. No. Okay, so we don't have a policy. All right, that's all I wanted to I don't know the school district that does. Well, I know in my industry they do. That's why yeah. I, I'm, not, that's why I'm asking, is there a policy? Okay, all right, so in my industry we have to report and disclose everything. That's why I'm asking that question. And that's all I have to say. But I'd like Go to ahead. Mr. Wells Muller, I strongly disagree with your contention that I have a conflict of interest in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I think that the seminal rule that you cited there is the 1.13 organization as a client. I represent the Board of Education as an entity, not the individual members. And that's really the key rule that you should focus on. So I strongly disagree with you. I would never do anything to put this board in harm's way. I would not do anything to put myself in harm's way or my firm in harm's way. And that's all I'm going to say about it. I tend to disagree in this matter because you represent this person as a board member in that district as a board. That is it's not true. Fair. It's not true. So you don't represent other schools? I don't districts. represent individual board members. Right. Okay. But okay, we're, we're, we're not going to get into a debate. You got your answer. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, I've said for a long time that this board has done everything proper and legal and we've tried to make this process as painful as possible. And we say <laughs> 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 As everyone knows, there's been a ruling, and that judge said, quite honestly, that this board has done everything legally, lawfully, and proper. Not true. <laughs> Here's another judge. Okay. Uh, anybody else like to speak? Okay. Close to the public. Does anyone have any old business? Anyone have any new business? Okay, board comments. Mr. Chair Dan. Thank you, Mr. Slotsky. Uh, thank Sorry. you for correcting yourself. I appreciate that. Um, I will be brief. I wish everyone a uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, whatever your religious domination is, whatever it is, a uh, Happy New Year. I'm looking forward to the to New Year, and I wish everyone the best. Thank you. Chris Darcy. Wow. Happy holiday to everybody, um, and I look forward to the concerts that are coming up in the next two weeks. Um, I also want to say, Mr. Robinson, I, I know I've only worked with you for a brief time, 
but I've enjoyed my time with you. You are a wealth of knowledge, and you have been my my partner sitting up here um, you know, for each meeting. And I, I will miss you today. On um, the the month I participate phone call for the historic. <laughs> I've done a while and retired 14 years. So. <laughs> Mr. Robinson, um, <laughs> I would like to thank all of our administrators who came forth when it was needed. And to say that there was anything wrong with our administrators, I've had the pleasure for the last few months to listen to Dr. Banjo and he must have been doing something right because he's a hell of a person. He really is. And, and I appreciate her wealth of knowledge and her well, humor, for one thing. And I, and I think that was something that he desperately needed. But this, is, this school system, it's everybody that counts. I mean, we all count here somewhere. And from our, our custodial staff, who does a super job, to all of our people. And uh, I got to say that it, it's been a much easier to ride uh, because of that. But things went very, very well for a very long time. And I just want to thank you all for all your hard work. And, and my friends here for all your hard work. For, I'm not getting paid for it. So, you don't get paid. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get paid. Didn't get the letter. I told you it was once a year. Remember that budget we had? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Reed? Uh, first, I have a question. I want to tell you what we're doing. I want to tell you what we're doing. I want to tell you what we're doing. We're going to fix that. It's one of the best things ever. And we usually video it. And we could do it as like there's a freshman in the community so I'll go to the community to the seniors but having those students come back to our freshman now in college is a wealth of information. I uh, hope they don't want to see more through their peers more than they want to see through them. I was just going to say, you can do it. I can do it. Oh, wow.
about the exercise <laughs> in the school district history. He has served as president of the Ontario's Committee. He is a part of the past exciting uh, facility in Queensland and educational initiatives in Romano. He was there when the middle school was built and the upper L became Chester Stevens Elementary. He oversaw the referendum and expansion of Mount Isle High School and included a 1,500 seat reform yard for replacing the pit. And as I was about to mention, it was not pit. <laughs> Some of us uh, do the end of the pit. Thank you. Uh, Bill has led the development of new playing fields at Mount Isle Middle School and High School. He promoted and supported the UMG policy. We remember that going through that and going through that. People tell us it wasn't going to work, and it was great because it was an alumni panel where a student said he felt he failed to help his room, and the dean said, you know, you've got to do this. I said, no, I'm not knowledge. You failed and you got to do it. You have to improve on your grade. And I said, yes, that was affirmation that that was great, having a new dean policy. Uh, there were drastic improvements in our high school, including plastic classroom upgrades, building additions, and development expansion of the creative and practical arts, such as our popular TV media, uh, media program and our energy team. The district also worked with the Mount Isle High School TV media program with wireless cameras, teleprompters, and a new on location media bus. The high school tax sale system was dramatically upgraded as well. Anybody who knows me too many years ago, that was very much needed. Mount Isle High School robotics program has both of its robotics teams invited to the Grand National Robotic Championship and has been recognized numerous times in the past few years. We replaced all television, don't say that. Knows that we had televisions in all of our high school classrooms with new video screens for high definition viewing. We upgraded electrical lighting units and district school saving money each year in utility expenses. The district revamped substitute quality control systems, and that was when we used to have a person doing our, um, our subbing. That's the call outs. And this includes a sub incentive system also. We opened two solar fields, one at Tinch Road and the other at Sandshore. We saved the district each year in electricity. We introduced and expanded the use of online grading on the way down to kindergarten with powerful and now real time. We can't forget the MOHS video book that even this does video that went viral across the nation. Open the middle learning spaces at Mount Olive High School, including the Innovation Lab, the Maker Space, Workshop, the Mad Hodge Table, two additional offices for STEM and a host of storage areas, as well as a state of the art recording studio, isolation booth, two new science lab spaces, photo lab, team rooms performance area, we expand our art program, and we are a big proponent of our art program. Many of the students have gone on to receive numerous awards, while other schools were eliminating and downsizing their music and art programs, we increased ours. We renovated the Mountain View Elementary School Library as one of the finest student centered libraries in New Jersey. We replaced 18 quick soccer multi-purpose playing fields at Mount Olive High School, and we installed the turf field in back at Mount Olive High School. We installed a turf soccer field at Mount Olive uh, middle school, through all the fields to play at night. Installed a basketball car stadium at Mount Olive High School for football, soccer, band, lacrosse, and other any other good public events such as pep rallies and graduation. We procured a new administrative office complex. We all know we have all the building over there. That was it. Um, I was guessing the other day that includes over 24,000 square feet of new space and almost 18,000 square feet of prime office space. For our administration and board of education. That's, that's good to hear that in there. Help to put a computer in the hands of every student because at the time there was no plug. We didn't have computers. That student had in their hands. All classrooms were wired with their own internet portal. We remember that from the beginning of how we didn't get internet access in some of the classrooms also. And then we did that. Uh, the district improved home school communications by revamping its website and we revamped it again. We worked to initiate the area's largest student day summer camp. Our students, as well as those from around the world, attend. Renovated tennis courts, added a new court. This will look in the past few years, it's like I'm getting tired of saying every time you work harder. We let it be done with many new course offerings, open new programs for special needs students, multiple disabled special needs math programs. The district expanded again, like I said, its art program because we can't forget the rock and roll academy music program with audio engineering and more choirs and bands. We introduced a drone club where we had advanced technology education. Maybe we had a nice, beautiful tank of students working at the high school in underwater robotics. We were a part of introducing full day kindergarten and self funded health care for additional savings. A lot of people learned that that was a good move and following our lead. We also held first student led conferences to promote student thinking. Looked at a talent program expanded. We implemented our program to be doing the everyday thing. We updated the heating air conditioning system. The cameras that were installed, not only in the classroom, but park, uh, parking lots that we had been paid for and painted. We did things with 
gym teacher that night off high school in CMS and we ran every trip from the school supplies and classroom materials. And so digital phones in every room. That was something that we had a little phone by the door that the teachers would use. Uh, smart boards in all our classrooms. Professional Development Center at Mount Olive High School. We will sorely miss his energy, enthusiasm, and most of all, his heart. Think about all his students. <laughs> On behalf of both past, present, and future Mount Olive students, <clears throat> thank you. <laughs> I'm going to read the exact uh, same accomplishments. That <laughs> I apologize. I actually have to leave uh, for personal matters. Uh, so I'm going to try to make mine as quick as possible. Uh, I'd like to um, want to say congratulations to the All Eastern Award winners, the North Jersey Band winners, the debate team, all the uh, Honor Society students that got in from math and World Capital of Victory. Uh, good luck tomorrow on the blood drive. Uh, it's phenomenally run by a uh, student, Debbie Drops. Um, I would like to thank Mr. Robinson, Dr. Bangia, and all of the instructional supervisors for a great presentation. Congrats to the Lego League and Mrs. Lovett. Uh, I'd like to thank our PTO presence for, again, phenomenal job. I go to some of the things, ladies, absolutely fantastic. Uh, I want to congratulate Mr. Fellini for being put into the Morris County Hall of Fame Wrestling. Wow. Um, and I also, too, want to say uh, to Mr. Robinson, um, as a student of uh, Mount Olive and Dr. Fangi as well, I had kind of was in school when you started the Board of Ed. And here we are now. and. I can see the difference that you have made in the school, and obviously it's pretty evident by that five-page report. <laughs> um, the thesis. Yes, uh, and I, I'm sorry that uh, you didn't get to be elected, and you can still kind of tap into that great knowledge, especially with the referendum coming up. Um, I'm sorry that I didn't get more time, or took more time to kind of be mentored by you or tap into your wisdom. Um, sorry that you kind of had... Um, that people have attacked or tried to attempt it to mar your stellar accomplishments in the last couple of years. Uh, but most of all, I, I think I'm sorry that I'm not more like you. Oh, nice. so, uh, everybody, happy holidays. Thank you. You will be missed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was building. Uh, so, uh, you heard about the first Lego League, and I just want to say congratulations to everyone who put that together, from the high school staff and the students from Moore, Don Beery, who's a dancing machine, and the Sandshore students for representing Mount Olive in the championship. That was a very great showing all around. Prior to going to the first Lego League, I actually was judging the NJIT Real World Connections, where Mount Olive has several middle school students and a couple of high school students. Uh, Roshan, who is actually on the executive team and will be a part of the leadership program, which starts, starts today. Uh, Sarah, Mohi, and Kaviashri were also part of from Mount Olive, as well as Sven. And just to get a sample of some of the activities, some of the tracks that these kids were involved in, app design, game design, digital marketing, cybersecurity, intro to programming in Python, entrepreneurship, making tiny computers, game development using Java, and web development. And Sven was on the team that was the overall winner of making tiny computers. So hopefully, we can get some of those students uh, at uh, the next board meeting, maybe in February, January, so that they can share with the board, the community, what they've been doing at NJIT and, and this totally remarkable skill in coding that they've been uh, nurturing over the past couple of years and the leadership opportunities that they're gaining by being a part of the program. And the Jazz Comedy Night on December 1st was very nice. I was there because it was such a busy meeting night for me. I only got to stay and hear a little bit of the comedy, but 
the part that I saw, it was really, really good. I know some of my other colleagues were there. And the last board meeting, we were talking about uh, losses to the Mount Olive community. And here we are again, talking about another loss, another tragic loss. Last month it was Dara's family, and now we are offering our condolences to Lynn Brown's family, as well as Janet Kenny and the other family. Uh, tragic losses, but our hearts go out to you and your family. And I know Dr. Banjir has shared with me about Glenn. And I will end on, on this note, your early bill. <laughs> you may not remember, but the, the first time we really actually met was, it was geez, it had to be like the mid 2000s when I was this newly minted doctor and I was a hotshot principal and I just thought I knew everything about habit funding, which I really did. But <laughs> Bill just argued me back and forth about uh, how money was being shifted from us and going to the average district. He was really passionate about maintaining funding opportunities for students in our Olive. Little did I know, years later, we would serve together on the board. But I really saw the true heart of Bill. You heard about all of his accomplishments, and he goes to all of the events. But when you need a friend, Bill Robinson is your guy. Because <laughs> most folks know the, the past couple of years, and I'm not even talking about this stuff with my own four, Past couple of years have been kind of rough. And when in education things go kind of rough for you, people kind of move away from you. And Bill stepped in. Our breakfasts and lunches were an opportunity to decompress and to forget about all the trouble. And we would laugh and joke, and Bill is really a funny guy in his own way. <laughs> so, Bill, for all of that, you do for the district and all of that you have done for me <clears throat> over the past couple of years personally. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. You have no idea what meeting for coffee, for breakfast, for lunch has been for me. You said that I was doing you a favor. In fact, you were actually reaching out a hand and doing you a favor. And I will be forever grateful for that. And lunch is on you next time. <laughs> <laughs> and having said that, I want to wish everybody a happy holidays, happy Kwanzaa, happy Hanukkah, be safe, be merry, enjoy your family, and we will see you in 2020. Okay. okay, well, I cannot compete to, with you guys, <laughs> so I am just going to ditto everything they said. I want to thank everyone for all their hard work this year, um, and all the administrator, the kids, everybody. We just have had a a fabulous year. Um, Bill, you're a very special person, and I wish you all the best, and we are really going to miss you. Some of us are going to. Ah, <laughs> some of us. We're certainly not going to miss the emails that I send out, <laughs> misinforming the board on certain things. So, at least um, you're going out on a funny note there with that. I mean, come on. Um, but thank you, Bill, for everything that you've done for us. Thank you, too, to the administrators and Dr. Bangia and Mr. Robinson for the wonderful and thorough and honest um, report that we, that we received tonight. That, that's much appreciated, really. And thank you to all the teachers. I know that I'm, I'm specifically speaking to the middle school, and I'm... I'm I know that it's for everyone, but thank you for a wonderful first trimester because we had a great first trimester, especially at mom's, but you know, everywhere. But I'm just saying, middle school was really, really great. Um, I look forward to working with Louisa in her new role as board member when she steps in next year. Um, and I'm just trying to have, have a wonderful and, and happy, healthy holiday, everyone, and a very wonderful year. We'll see you when we come back. Dr. Bencher. Believe it or not, I tend not to plan my, um, my, my speeches or what I'm going to say. I, I jot notes um, just because certainly I wanted to capture um, the essence of who um, Mr. Robinson is. 
Um, I had the pleasure of officially meeting Ms. Mr. Robinson at my appointment back in April, so it certainly hasn't been that long. But what I did this past weekend with my daughter was go back to my yearbook mm -hmm. and um, looking at um, the board members, and I saw both Mr. Robinson and Mr. Sterlachi there. Mm -hmm. And um, certainly one of the main reasons that I wanted to come back to Mount Olive was this essence of community, of coming home. Mm -hmm. I know most people feel that you can never go home, but I have been privileged to do that. And certainly working alongside with Mr. Robinson, not only in the official capacity of these meetings and subcommittees, but also his ability to stop by and just to say hello and check on me and to see how I was doing really solidified my decision to come back home. So I can't thank you enough for welcoming me um, with open arms. Um, I thank you for your uh, hard work. Your legacy will certainly live on. And I look forward to seeing you in the near future because we are certainly a better district because of all your hard work. And I can't thank you enough, Mr. Robinson. Okay, let me take it down memory lane a little bit longer because Bill and I have a special bond. Um, Bill and I have, first of all, been on the board for every superintendent we've had. When we came to Mount Olive, Mount Olive had 9,000 people and now has 29,000 people. We had the Bud Lake School, we had the Flanders School, we were K to eight. We then built the, we built the upper L and then we built three elementaries, the high school, in addition on the high school, the new middle school and so on and so forth. So we've been through a lot together and uh, it's just been terrific working with Bill. Uh, everybody seems to be eulogizing you tonight. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't really, I don't eulogize you. But in any event, uh, don't worry about Bill. Bill will still be around. All you have to do is go to some event at the high school or middle school. You'll find Bill. As a matter of fact, I think they're going to lock him out one of these days. But he goes to every day. <laughs> and he'll be, he'll be help us with the referendum. And, uh, I know we're going to have, still have some good talks together. He'll come up by store. And uh, you got to come up. But sometimes you got to wake me up before I'm sleeping. But uh, Bill, I wish you the best. You and Peg have a good holiday. And everyone else, please have a nice holiday. And at this point in time, I will take a motion for confidential session. Second. Be resolved that the board meet in confidential session for the purpose of discussing personnel, matters of attorney client privilege, pending the anticipated litigation, and confidential truthful matters. Have roll call, please. This is Aquino? Yes. This is Becker? Yes. Becker Gales? Yes. Dr. Giordano? Yes. Mrs. Narcisse? Yes. Mrs. Gina? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Schlecht? Yes. Jose? No action.